Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's weekly webinar on exegesis. My name is Brady Beard. I'm the reference and instruction librarian at Pitt's Theology Library. And I'm looking forward to beginning a conversation with you about exegesis and what it is, uh, as well as some tools and tricks for how you can uh, begin doing exegesis if you haven't already. To begin with, I'd first like to send this poll to you. And if you want to participate, uh, you can do so now by clicking on the poll. And the statement is, uh, quote, exegesis is a brand new concept to me. And you can vote either by agreeing or disagreeing. Uh, but this is uh, really helpful for us as the reference team to know uh, as we look to future questions and interactions with you all about exegesis. But let's start with just a quick definition about what exegesis is and what it is not. Uh, so put really simply, exegesis is the work of hearing the biblical text on its own terms and then turning around and sharing what you've heard or what you've learned with others. Uh, we already do a good bit of exegesis in our daily lives uh, when we're not interacting with the biblical text. Exegesis literally means to draw out from, and it's the idea of drawing meaning from a text or uh, could even be applied to other areas of our life. So one of the examples that I like to use is when you get a piece of mail uh, in your mailbox and it's stamped all over the outside in big red letters and it says important, open immediately, uh, you probably are able to do a little bit of exegesis from that uh, piece of mail to know that you're probably dealing with a piece of junk mail. If you're like me, you might open that uh, up and on the inside you see some sort of offer that you're not interested in and then it goes right into the recycling bin. Uh, so exegesis is really the process of taking our cues from uh, the text and knowing and understanding that text better and then turning around and applying that text, whether that's in a sermon or in a research paper or in a Bible study of some kind. The process of exegesis has really uh, three steps. Now, these are, of course, perhaps a bit oversimplified, but this is the basic sort of structure of any approach to exegesis. Uh, the first is that we need to listen to the text. We need to try to hear the text on its own terms. Then we test what we heard with other communities or other readers or other groups of people to see if what we heard actually falls in line with a sort of consensus of uh, interpretation of that text. And then the last step is to explain the text. And this is where we turn to a paper or a sermon or other type of presentation. What you'll probably notice is that I'm drawing a pretty firm distinction between the actual process of exegesis and the final product. So another way of thinking about exegesis, uh, we've already talked about exegesis as sort of a, an attempt to close read or to understand something on its own terms. The second sort of way of thinking about exegesis is that it is all of the research that you'll take, uh, that you'll do on the biblical text before you even begin to talk about the text. So. Another way that I like to frame exegesis is in terms of sort of uh, two steps. First, the actual exegesis process where I read the text and I study the text and I do research around the text. And then a second follow-up process where I begin to put all of that research and information to work, uh, usually either in a sermon or in a research paper of some kind. So let's talk about that first step of listening to the text. Listening to the text requires a close reading. It also requires attention to the literary and historical context. This is crucial in allowing us to pay attention to what is actually being said and not just what we hear. 
Have you ever been in one of those conversations where you say something and the person that you're talking to uh, either interprets what you said in a totally different way or they take a major, uh, their major conclusion is something totally different from what you said? This is, of course, the problem of the speaker and the listener and that sort of question of what gets lost in translation. So the first step of exegesis is attuning to the text and listening to the text, paying attention to what the text actually says rather than what we think it says. Some really good ways to begin listening closely to the text are by reading the text in its original language. Uh, many of you probably know that the biblical text is written largely in Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, and Koine Greek, Biblical Greek in the New Testament. And of course, the best way of understanding what the text is saying is to know what it says in the original languages. But if you don't know Hebrew or Greek, or you're not interested in learning those language, languages, another good way of sort of hearing what the text is actually saying is to read in multiple translations preferably translations that have some different philosophical approaches to translation or maybe different goals in mind uh, for their translation, their final translation. We'll look at a tool in just a minute uh, that can help you sort of read the text uh, in multiple translations at once. After you do this sort of close reading, you're going to begin to move into another sort of substage of reading where you pay attention to specific words or key phrases and start asking questions about the genre and form, the historical realities that sort of shape the text in its initial context. And you can start asking questions about the text's theological perspective, which may or may not be different from your own. This sounds like a lot of work, and it is, I'm going to show you some tools that can help you get started on this process. But essentially what you are going to need is multiple translations. My recommendation is three translations, one that you're familiar with and like to preach from or like to read on your own, one that is going to be uh, sort of different from what you like to read. So if you like, you know, a really modern translation, you might look into using something like the King James translation. Conversely, if you really like the King James, you might think about using a more sort of contemporary sounding translation. You'll need access to a good Bible dictionary and probably a concordance. So let's talk about some of these tools. So textual tools that can help you listen to the text include things like Bible Gateway for reading multiple translations at once, Step Bible or Blue Letter Bible for beginning to understand what the words actually mean in their sort of historical and literary context, and a good Bible dictionary that will supply uh, you with a source to turn to, a resource to turn to, if you run into any sort of problems or you need help understanding uh, something. So let's take a look at a few of these tools. First, I want to show you Blue Letter Bible. I'm sorry, Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway is an excellent tool to begin reading the text in multiple translations. Here you can see that I've done a quick search for John 3 in the New International Version, and I can add parallels to this chapter simply by clicking this little button that says Add Parallel, and it automatically adds the King James Version, and I can add one more, and again, it adds the King James Version, and I can drop down and I can select a different translation that I might be interested in reading. Now, immediately what you'll notice is that each of these three translations has sort of organized the layout of the text differently, which can be a really important sort of cue for you as a reader. And as you begin reading each one of these, you'll notice that they use different terms and different types of words to translate the original Hebrew text. Uh, and so you might... Uh, Re, uh, read down into a verse like, uh, let's say, verse 
10. And you might be reading, you might start reading here and pick up across all three different translations to see how different translators are translating things differently. When you come across a word that's been translated differently, this is a good indication that you have uh, an opportunity to do further research. And so you might start turning your attention to doing a word study on that particular word. Uh, another good way to sort of turn to that word study is if you find a word that you think you know really well or a concept that you feel really confident in and very familiar with, uh, this can also be a good indication that you should do some digging around so that you can sort of put your own biases in check. So my recommendation is twofold. As you read in multiple translations, first look for words or phrases that have been translated differently and use that as an opportunity to start doing further research about what that word means and ask questions about why the translators might have translated it differently. Conversely, if you come across a phrase or a word or a concept that you feel very confident in and that you think you know um, sort of very fully, do a little bit of work to sort of check your own assumptions and do some research. So let's take an example. So here, uh, John 3.16, a very popular text, a text that many people know. You might say that you might feel that you know exactly what it means when the text says, for God so loved the world. You know exactly what that word loved means and you feel confident in that meaning. This would be a good spot to say, hold on, wait a minute, do I actually know what the, the author is, how they are using this word loved? And so you might want to start using some different tools to help you understand. Two tools can be really useful for doing this sort of word study. The first is Step Bible. And Step Bible, um, all of these links are in both the PowerPoint and in the handout that are available for you to download. And so you could go to Step Bible and you could go to John 3.16 and you could hover over this word loved and you'll see down at the bottom that an initial sort of definition pops up and it's just a short little definition which can be helpful, but you also might want to know where else this word in the Bible, where this word is used elsewhere in the Bible. And this is important because as we know, words mean different things in different contexts, and the context of a word can help us to understand what it means uh, elsewhere. And so if we were to click on this word, over here on the right-hand side of the screen, we'll see a much larger uh, definition with all sorts of information that may be of use to you. And we can also click on the number of times that it occurs in the Bible, which it occurs 145 times. And Step Bible will give us every single one of those references listed out. You can then start your process of sort of understanding this word better by going to the other places in the book of John where this word is used and doing a bit of reading. Then you might zoom out to the other gospels or perhaps the Johannine epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and so on and so forth. This is basically a uh, a sort of concordance shortcut that you can take. If you're familiar with using a concordance, you know that um, a concordance is useful for helping you to know what a word means and where else it's used in the, in the Bible. And this little website does a lot of that sort of concordance work for you. But maybe Step Bible isn't a tool that you're interested in using and you're more interested in engaging with a more traditional style of concordance. So you can go to something, to a website like Blue Letter Bible. And here I've simply run a search for John 3.16 and you'll see the verse shows up right here and it's searched in the King James Version. And if I want to know more information about the words and the verse here, I just need to open the little tools box and you'll see that it breaks down the verse word by word 
down this little column. And it gives both the Greek word that sort of is in the original uh, text, as well as this Strong's concordance number. Strong's concordance uh, basically gives a number to every word in the Bible. And this numbering system allows you to find all of the other places where that word is used in the Bible without having to know the Hebrew and Greek. So instead of knowing what the Greek word is for love, all you have to know is the Strong's number, which in this case is G for Greek, 25. And you can click on that and it will give you the dictionary definition of the word as well as all of the places that this word has been used elsewhere in the Bible. This is the same sort of thing that we saw on Step Bible. It's just presented a little bit differently. You can also, of course, use a regular concordance, a physical concordance, to help you along those lines. But as we know, in this particular semester, having online tools at our disposal is a really great option. You'll also want to be using dictionaries. You could look up the word love in a Bible dictionary, for instance, and you'll find all sorts of information about what that word means and the information it conveys in the ancient world. And I've listed some online dictionaries in this PowerPoint that you can download and then used to click. Current Candler students have access to an online version of the New Interpreter's Bible Dictionary. Uh, the HarperCollins Dictionary is abridged, but it's freely accessible on the Society of Biblical Literature's Bible Odyssey website. And I would encourage you to use that Bible Odyssey website if you haven't already. It's a great place to get started on any sort of Bible research or exegesis project that you might be doing. Other reference tools that will be especially important for this first stage include encyclopedias. And again, I've listed some online encyclopedias for you, including the little series, the Oxford Encyclopedias of the Bible and. This is a great series and I encourage you to check it out. We have online access uh, to this series for currently enrolled Candler students, as well as the Encyclopedia of the Bible and its reception. These can help give you a sort of clue into the ancient world and uh, even whole books of the Bible. In fact, you might read the entry on the Gospel of John, for instance, if you're writing an exegesis project on John 3.16. Other things that you'll want to begin paying attention to at this early stage are other texts from the ancient world that can help you sort of understand what the... Uh, what the world was like around the time that a particular biblical text uh, is thought to have been written. And I've included some online uh, editions for you to check out here as well. The Context of Scripture, Hidden Riches, the Loeb Classical Library, and TLG. Pitts also has plenty of research guides on this sort of first step of the exegetical process. And I encourage you to look at those as you have time because they will be really very helpful for you. Now, you might notice that we've done all of this work and uh, not yet have we gone to the commentators. We haven't had to open a single commentary yet. And the reason for that is really on the first pass of an exegetical process, a project, you should be doing uh, a lot of the work on your own. Uh, digging into the text to see what the text says and starting to do some of that initial word study and study of the text as a piece of literature first. You can, of course, and should use dictionaries and encyclopedias to help you along the way. And only after you feel confident that you have a sort of idea about what the text is doing and what it's saying, should you turn to the use of commentaries. So once you've read the text a couple of times and done some basic research on your own and sort of outlined a research path for yourself, you can begin to test your preliminary conclusions and join a conversation with the commentators. 
to find commentaries and to begin engaging with commentators on scripture, you can use the library catalog, the ATLA religion database, and the Old Testament and New Testament commentary guides available on the PITS website. Or of course, you can also speak with your instructor or a reference librarian about additional resources that will be of use for you. The most important thing as you begin to turn to commentaries is that you should read them with a critical eye. No commentary is going to answer every question and every commentary is going to have its sort of own perspective and its own uh, its own direction that it's trying to go. And so always be reading commentaries with uh, with a critical eye. Let's talk some more about commentaries though. Commentators discuss the biblical text in several ways. They might publish a commentary on a particular book of the Bible, which is really just a book about a book or a part of a book. So you might find a commentary on the book of Exodus or even on Exodus chapters 1 to 20, for instance. Commentators also discuss the biblical text in monographs. Uh, these are usually much more specific studies of a theme or an idea or even just one or two verses rather than the whole book. Or they might publish articles on a specific book or particular passage. Uh, as I've already mentioned, commentaries have different foci. They have sort of different goals in mind. And any particular commentary may be more or less theological, literary, homiletical, or technical. So you'll want to find the right type of commentary for your needs, and also make sure that you're asking the right types of questions uh, of the that specific type of commentary. Uh, you won't want to necessarily be asking uh, really in-depth homiletical questions of a purely technical commentary, for instance. And by technical, I mean a commentary that's dealing with uh, the words, the phrases, and the historical context versus a homiletical commentary that might be uh, more exploring the different ways that someone could preach that biblical text. Regardless, every commentary that you read is a snapshot into how the text was understood at a particular time, in a particular place, and for a particular group of people. And so uh, it's important, as I've already mentioned, to read commentaries with a sort of critical eye uh, to make sure that you don't lose yourself and your own research in the process of reading the commentators. Think of reading the commentaries as sort of joining a conversation. You want to be well versed in all of all of things that's in the conversation before you just jump in, but you also don't just want to accept what everybody else says uh, without doing some critical thought uh, on the topic on your own. I've already mentioned that there are different types of commentaries uh, out there in the world. There are homiletical, technical, theological, and historical sort of commentaries. Uh, these commentaries uh, tend to be published in series, different series that have different fo focuses and that ask the commentators to sort of bring their research to a particular point. So some popular homiletical that is preaching commentaries include this commentary series Feasting on the Word or Interpretation. A technical commentary, which I've already mentioned, will deal in the nitty gritty of the language and the text and the history, are commentaries like Hermeneia and the Anchor Bible Yale commentary series. Other commentaries uh, tend to be a bit more theological and they're interested in relating the theological picture of the biblical text to the theological picture that contemporary readers are in. And these include things like the Word Bible Commentary Series, the Old and New Testament Library, the Jewish Publication Society, and the Wisdom Commentary. Another sort of fourth type of commentary that you might run into are what I consider to be sort of reception historical commentaries. These types of commentaries are usually the ones that you can find available for free online and um, would include things like John Wesley's notes on the Bible or Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible. 
for the purposes of an academic paper, you want to really be careful with using commentaries that you find freely online and to treat those best as a sort of snapshot into a particular world. Uh, in the case of John Wesley's notes on the Bible, you might want to be reading them as sort of a glimpse into what was going on in the 18th and 19th centuries and how John Wesley and his early followers sort of read and understood the Bible rather than taking it as a sort of academic standard on, uh, say, the book of Exodus, for instance. As uh, with all areas of research, biblical scholars continue to learn more every time they go to the biblical text. I'll give you an example. Until around 1948, 1950, there were several words in the Hebrew Bible that scholars just didn't really uh, understand, or there were several ideas that they just didn't really understand how they were, um, how the Hebrew Bible was used in the time of uh, Jesus and Jesus' earliest followers. And then uh, archaeologists uh, uncovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran Caves and the Qumran Library. This discovery helped biblical scholars to understand an entire way that uh, early Christians and early Jews were reading the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And as we learned more about Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, we also learned more about the, the Hebrew Bible and uh, how people were reading it um, sort of 2,000 years ago. This is, of course, information that people like John Wesley didn't have. And so it's always a good idea to sort of be reading with a critical eye and to be reading commentaries as a, as a snapshot into a particular world. And that's even true of modern commentaries, contemporary commentaries. Other sorts of historical or reception commentaries that you might be interested in, in reading would include things from early Judaism and early Christianity, including Second Temple literature, pseudepigrapha, other early Christian texts. Uh, and you can use things like the ancient Christian commentaries or even begin reading rabbinic materials to help you sort of understand that world. Now, these are all technically commentaries, but they're commentaries in a broader sense than what we usually mean when we when we talk about using commentaries uh, for the exegesis project. So how can you find articles then? Well, there are several different ways to find publications on the biblical text. You can use the um, ATLA, uh, the ATLA EBSCO search, which we have linked on the PITS homepage as well as these other links. And I want to show you just one of the best ways to use ATLA to search for specific biblical texts. Uh, here we have the homepage for ATLA. So I got to this page, I navigated to this page by going to pits.emory.edu and then selecting the ATLA religion database on the left-hand side of the homepage. And it will take you to this screen. And you could try to search for Exodus 1 here in this top search bar. And you would probably find a few resources that uh, would be of help to you. I need to refresh this page. So here are the steps that I took to get to it. Here we go. So I could look for Exodus 1 and uh, you can see that I'm getting some results, but I'm also getting results that have nothing to do with Exodus chapter 1. And that's because this search is picking up the 1 from 1 Corinthians and Exodus from this reference to the book of Exodus. So if I want to limit my results, I can use this little scriptures tab up here at the top. I can drop down to the book of Exodus and expand to chapters. I could even expand further and go into verses, but I just want to see chapter one at this point. And this will give me all the results that are specific to Exodus chapter one. And you'll see no first Corinthians in this list. I can then of course continue to refine my results on the left-hand side by going and selecting just English if that's what I'm interested in. 
And then I can open and read the text right here on this website or download it and save it to my computer. So that's using the ATLA, uh, the ATLA search uh, index. So let's take a look at what other resources might be available to us. After you've done this work of reading the comment, of uh, reading the text on your own, beginning to make some preliminary conclusions about the text, and then turning to the commentators and articles, you will need to begin putting all of this information together. And this step is perhaps one of the most challenging because every exegesis project will have a unique desired outcome and focus. That is to say, exegesis for a sermon or a Bible study will probably look different than an exegetical course assignment for a biblical studies class at Candler. What you need in your church context might be different than what your professor is asking you to do. Also, as you continue to take courses at Candler, you'll notice that theologians and biblical scholars do exegesis slightly differently and for particular purposes. So the very first thing you'll want to do as you begin thinking about how you're going to explain and present your uh, research on the text is to, by cons is to begin considering your audience. And you should be doing that from the very beginning, but especially as you think about putting all of your information together. So identify what type of project you need to do. Is it a paper? Is it a sermon? Is it a Bible study? And then begin thinking about your audience. And you can even begin exegeting your audience by asking questions like, who are they? How does this text relate to them? What might they know or want to know about the text? What might be new or shocking to them as they hear this text preached or as they read it for themselves? You can then begin to build your focus or thesis statement around the research that you've done and the needs of your audience. And as you do that, you can start outlining your argument. I always suggest that uh, folks be cautious with thematic organization of exegesis papers, uh, and probably the preferred way of outlining an exegesis paper is by going either verse by verse or section by section, so that you don't sort of front load uh, any particular assumption about the text with your thematic organization. Because if you think that a text might be about one particular theme or theological concept, as you do the, exe the actual exegesis, you may find that the text is about something different and something else entirely. You'll then want to support your argument and your research by returning to the text and engaging in the secondary evidence, that is, the commentators. So every claim you make in an exegesis paper should have some sort of referent in the text itself, in the historical context in which the text was first written, and or in the secondary literature, i.e. the commentators. Finally, then, you'll want to conclude your argument. Why does your research or your particular argument or even your voice matter? What do you bring to the conversation that is either overlooked or particular to who you are as a reader and preacher and thinker about the Bible? So, like I said, explaining the text is where all of these moving pieces begin to come together. Finally, there are some technical issues that we should talk about very quickly. You'll want to make sure to use the right academic style for an exegesis paper at Candler. You will likely be asked to use either the Society of Biblical Literature, SBL, style, or the Chicago Turabian style. These styles are very similar, uh, and the SBL style really only has a few changes to how you abbreviate things like biblical books or whether or not you italicize biblical books. And so 
Uh, if you pick one of those and use them, you'll be okay. They both use the footnote style, and it's relatively easy to, to learn and to use. Uh, in this PowerPoint, I have linked to the SBL student supplement, which you can find online. And this has an example paper of what an SBL paper uh, formatting should look like, as well as a quick guide to doing citation. If you're interested in learning more about the process of exegesis, I encourage you to read Mary Hinkle's essay, Exegesis for Textual Preaching in Word and World from 1999. This is available open access online, and so anyone can read this essay. It's a very helpful essay, and I think will clarify any remaining questions that you might have. And then as always, please feel free to reach out to reference librarians at Pitt's Library. We're always ready and willing to help talk with you about exegesis. Uh, all of our reference librarians have theological training. We've all done exegesis projects and exegesis papers. So we know the particular challenges they can present. And we're uh, always here to help you sort of understand exegesis and find the best resources uh, for your for your own research. And uh, if that doesn't work, I'd encourage you to check out the research guide on exegesis at the Pitts website as well. And again, all of that information is linked uh, in this uh, in this presentation, which you can download. I have time this afternoon to take a few questions. I see at least one in the chat. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to just type it into the chat or in the Q&A box, and I'll answer it. The first question has to do with Step Bible. And uh, they ask, in Step Bible, is there a preferred Greek source selection for the source? And the answer to that is that Step Bible uses the same Greek source for all of their uh, for all of their references to the Greek, and there's really only two sort of standard academic Greek sources, and Step Bible uses one of those. I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head, but you will um, you will you will. Uh, not run into any problems if you use uh, Step Bible as far as the Greek source selection because they've already done it for you and they're using the sort of academic standard. The other element to this question that I wasn't able to talk about earlier but I'll raise now has to do with using a concordance. However you begin to ask questions around particular Greek words, you want to make sure that your concordance, whether that's um, online or a physical concordance, matches the translation that you're using. And so I always recommend that one of the three translations you use for your study is a King James Version, because the King James Version of the Bible has uh, all sorts of readily available concordances that are keyed to that translation. Uh, and so what you want to do is whenever you use a concordance, you want to make sure that uh, you aren't missing any words that maybe the NIV translated differently from the King James Version. So whatever concordance you use, make sure your translation matches up with the concordance. And the concordance will tell you somewhere, either on the cover or in the initial first couple of pages, which translation it's keyed to, whether the NIV or the NRSV or the King James Version. So matching up your concordance to your translation is an important step. If there are, uh, yes, uh, this question, uh, it has to do with Step Bible or Blue Letter Bible. And um, the question is, neither Step Bible nor Blue Letter Bible has the NRSV, right? And the answer to that is yes, that is correct. Step Bible and Blue Letter Bible do not have the NRSV. They default to, I believe, Step Bible defaults to the ESV, the English Standard Version, and Blue Letter Bible defaults to the King James Version. Uh, but you can find the NRSV on Bible Gateway. And so if you like to read the NRSV, that's a really great place to go and you can sort of read the King James, read the NRSV, read one more, and then use either Step Bible or Blue Letter Bible 
to do that sort of concordance study that we've talked about. If there are no other questions this uh, for this session, I think I will go ahead and end the webinar. Oh, one last question. Uh, one of the questions for the Old Testament exegetical worksheet is to identify the form or genre of the text. Can you help with this in any way? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And this is usually one of the initial questions that uh, interpreters should be thinking about as they begin reading. One of the best ways that you can begin to understand the form or genre of a text is by reading about that text in a dictionary or an encyclopedia. Usually, if you can find an entry, say, on the book of Exodus, uh, there will be comments there somewhere that will tell you more about the form and the genre of the text. You can also begin doing some of this on your own. For instance, you're probably able to recognize the difference between narrative, poetry, and legal code or law. This is a really great first pass at sort of answering this question. If you can identify one of those uh, main features, you're already halfway there. Then you can go to a dictionary or an encyclopedia and read a little bit more to help you understand what type of narrative or what type of uh, hymn or, or uh, poetic text it is or what type of legal code or law category this text falls in. Uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias are probably the first place I would go to get a, an answer to the question about form or genre. And if I'm not finding anything uh, in, a, in an encyclopedia, then I would go to a commentary. Uh, the commentaries usually tend to be a little more long-winded, though, and so you have to do a little bit more digging. So that's why I recommend starting with, with an encyclopedia or a dictionary. Well, with that, everyone, I think I will end our webinar for today. Please feel free to uh, reach out to us at pitts.emory.edu slash ask if you have any additional questions uh, or need help understanding what you're sort of being expected to do. We are more than happy to chat with you about an assignment or uh, about a uh, exegesis project that you have coming up. Thanks all for tuning in, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.